Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 178. Today's big Bible question, is the salvation of Jesus really and truly free? I mean, surely there are strings attached, right? Well, hello, friends. Happy Tuesday to you. The Bible readings today are strange and divided up today, so we don't have time for a proper introduction or any of our usual small and ridiculous talk because uh, I used all of my brain power trying to parse out our readings for the day. Today's Bible passages do include Deuteronomy 28, verses 20 through 68, Psalms 119, verses 25 through 48, Isaiah 55, and Matthew chapter 3. Okay, I guess in the final analysis that wasn't too complicated, but I gotta tell you, I am slightly intimidated by math, despite the fact that I married a math teacher, and I was myself a professional math teacher, uh, at least I was a long-term substitute for my dear wife for seven weeks of my life while she was on maternity leave for the first, uh, the birth of our first child. One day, I want to compile a list of tent maker jobs I've had in the uh, 25 or 26 years I've been in ministry. I think I could come up with maybe 50, maybe more jobs I've had, you know, different sort of jobs where I've earned at least $500, uh, you know, sort of staying in ministry and such. I don't actually know how to make tents like Paul did to do the same thing, but, you know, sometimes when you're young in ministry, and I guess, honestly, sometimes when you're middle and old in ministry too, you kind of do whatever you need to do. So just to bore you to tears before we get into some really good stuff, here's a partial list of non-ministry jobs I personally have had that if I made more than $500 at, probably more than a thousand for each of these jobs over the 20 something years, uh, since going into ministry, mover, painter, roofer, yard maintenance, high school English teacher, high school French teacher, high school math teacher, substitute teacher, junior high history teacher, college history professor, college Bible and theology professor, college computer science professor, private investigator. I wasn't licensed, but I did the work, surveillance and that sort of thing. Process server, fabric store employee. Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. Long-term storage employee. I don't even know what you call that, but I was a guy who helped people sign up their long-term storage and lockers and uh, uh, cubicle-like things. Uh, I helped them move in and I... Uh, called them when their bills were paid and all that. It wasn't the greatest job I've ever had. Um, job interview coach, radio host, web designer, computer repair guy, computer business owner, online marketing specialist, seminary teaching assistant, seminary grader, seminary remote video equipment operator, Uber driver. And yeah, one time a guy barfed in my car, about 50 pounds of barf, as I recall. Writer, videographer, law clerk, interviewer, blogger, and honestly, there's a lot more. But, you know, now you're bored. So let's get into the really good stuff. A few days ago in Revelation, we heard about how Jesus offers the water of life free of charge. Now, if you've lived in the world for long enough, you know by now, hopefully, to be skeptical of every free offer, right? Well, today in Isaiah, we're going to hear a little bit more about this same free offer of a particular kind of water. So let's read our passage in Isaiah 55 and consider whether or not the salvation offered by God as represented by the water is really free or not. Isaiah 55 verse 1, "'Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water, and you without silver, come, buy and eat.'" Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. I will make a permanent covenant with you on the basis of the faithful kindness of David, since I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. So you will summon a nation you do not know, and nations who do not not know you will run to you for the Lord your God even the Holy One of Israel has glorified you seek the Lord while he may be found call to him while he is near let the wicked at one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive for my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways this is the Lord's declaration for as high as heaven is higher than earth so my ways are higher 
higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. You will indeed go out with joy and be peacefully guided. The mountains and the hills will break into singing before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, a cypress will come up and instead of the briar, a myrtle will come up. This will stand as a monument for the Lord, an everlasting sign that will not be destroyed. So it sounds like an appealing offer, doesn't it? Living water from God that you don't need to money any kind of money to buy. It's free and without cost, says I, Isaiah. So what does this mean? Is it really free and is it worth it? Well, to begin to understand the meaning of this passage, let's fast forward a little bit in the Bible to the book of Jeremiah. And we find a little clue here in Jeremiah 2.13, which says, God is speaking and he says, my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug cisterns for themselves, like wells, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. So living water comes only from God. We can't make it ourselves. We can't dig wells to find it. We can't have big things to hold on to it. We can't produce it ourselves. And we, as we keep going to the Bible, we get a further little clue in John chapter 4, 13 and 14, where Jesus says, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, referring to the water at the well in Samaria. But, verse 14, whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. So we found out here that this living water from God is both free and eternally fulfilling in some sort of way. As we kind of going along, we're finding out the offer sounds better and better. But, you know, no one rides for free, right? And and something this good can't possibly uh, it be as good as it sounds. Well, let's keep going. I think we kind of get a bigger clue into this living water situation. In John chapter 7, verse 37, where Jesus says, On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Though Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So now we see the living water that's spoken of here stands for both salvation and also the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus offers this without cost to all who realize they are thirsty and have need of drink. So is it worth it? Well, let's ask Charles Spurgeon to help us understand what it is that God is offering us in Isaiah, what he's talking about in Jeremiah, and what what Jesus is crying out about in John chapter 7. Spurgeon says this, He that has no money to refers to a sinner who is emptied of all self-sufficiency. He has no merit to plead before God, no natural power, no good thing of his own. He's the one to whom this invitation is given. He that has no money. Those who will perish are those who think they have much money. They imagine that they could buy heaven itself if they wish to do so. They expect that their tears, their prayers, their Bible readings, their giving to the poor, their respectability, their their church attendance or their chapel goings, their observances of the Bible, and so on, will procure them a seat before the eternal throne of God. They have much money according to their mode of reckoning in terms of righteous deeds, but to such people, God never gives the right to drink of the river of the water of life. Unless his grace should prevent it, they will perish with all their supposed wealth and go down like the rich man in the parable to lift up their eyes in hell, being in torments, because they're trusting in their righteous deeds and not in Jesus. But if you, dear friend, have nothing of your own, no merit, no power, no strength, no atom of anything that can recommend you to God, there comes to you the gracious invitation of our text to everyone that thirsts. You who are old, you who are young, you who are rich, you who are poor, you who are educated, and you who are illiterate, you who earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, and you who 
gain it by the sweat of your brain. Everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. And if you have no money, you are bidden again to come and buy wine and milk too, without money and without price. This invitation is most abundant in its provision. A thirsty soul needs water and it's already provided. All that your soul can need is provided in the covenant of grace. God has not to make a feast for you. His oxen and fatlings are killed and he has sent out his servants to say to you, Come, for all things are now ready. Everything is already ready except for yourself. The fountain filled with the blood of Jesus is ready. The robe of righteousness is ready. The ring for your hand, the shoes for your feet, the music and those that shall make merry with you are all ready and waiting. There is no unreadiness in the kingdom of God's grace. The feast is ready. The unreadiness is all in your poor, unready soul. Notice too in our text that there is not only water provided Provided for the thirsty, but there is wine for those who are not only thirsty, but so faint and weak that they have no power to drink. Well, then, here is some wine to revive them. They're faint, they're feeble, but God's grace shall be as a strengthening medicine to them to put new life into them. The grace of God is not only a blessing to you who feel that you can receive it, but to you who seem utterly powerless. It gives the power which enables you to receive itself. The text also speaks not only of wine, but of wine and milk. If you are such a little child that you can't endure wine, maybe it's too strong for you, then here is milk, milk for babies. And if that were not enough, says Spurgeon, the Lord further says to us, eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in its richness. You are invited to buy and eat, so both food and drink are provided for you. In fact, poor sinner, all you can desire or need for the benefit of your immortal soul, you will find treasured up in Christ. There's nothing that is needed to make you fit for heaven except for what you find in Christ. He will be both Alpha and Omega to you, the first letter of the alphabet of grace and the last letter of its triumph and glory. You shall find Christ to be food suitable and convenient for the nourishment of your spiritual nature. You strong men can buy and eat, for in the gospel there is an abundance of strong meat provided for you. And you weak ones can buy wine and milk, for here is the reviving cordial and also the strengthening milk from the breast of divine love all ready for you. So you see, there is abundant provision for you. And where God is so liberal, with his provision, shall we hold back in our desires? Well, I love Spurgeon. I mean, for one, mighty man of God. For another, uh, he's pretty much C.S. Lewis level in terms of his ability with the spoken word. And man, does he point us to Jesus well in this passage. So friends, are you thirsty now? Come without price or without hindrance to the table of Jesus. Seek him and live. Look to him and live. Be ye saved by the grace and the living water that is in him. Amen. Let's keep reading. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 20 through 68. The Lord will send against you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you do until you are destroyed and quickly perish because of the wickedness of your actions in abandoning me. The Lord will make pestilence cling to you until he has exterminated you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will afflict you with wasting disease, fever, inflammation, burning heat, drought, blight, and mildew. Those will pursue you until you perish. The sky above you will be bronze and the earth beneath you iron. The Lord will the Lord will turn the rain of your land into falling dust. It will descend on you from the sky until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will march out against them from one direction, but flee from them in seven directions. You will be an object of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your corpses will be food for all the birds of the sky and the wild animals of the earth and no one to scare them away. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt, tumors, a festering rash, and scabies from which you cannot be cured. The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and mental confusion so that at noon you will grope as a blind person gropes in the dark. You will not be successful in anything you do. You will only be oppressed and robbed continually and no one will help you. You will 
become engaged to a woman, but another man will rape her. You will build a house, but not live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but not enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will not eat any of it. Your donkey will be taken away from you and not return to you. Your flock will be given to your enemies and no one will help you. Your sons and daughters will be given to another people while your eyes grow weary looking for them every day, but you will be powerless to do anything. A people you don't know will eat your land's produce and everything you've labored for. You will only be oppressed and crushed continually. You will be driven mad by what you see. The Lord will afflict you with painful and incurable boils in your knee, on your knees and thighs from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king that you have appointed to a nation neither you nor your ancestors have known, and there you will worship other gods of wood and stone. You will become an object of horror, scorn, and ridicule among all the peoples where the Lord will drive you. You will sow much seed in the field, but harvest little because locusts will devour it. You will plant and cultivate vineyards, but not drink the wine or gather the grapes because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your territory, but not moisten your skin with oil because your olives will drop off. You will father sons and daughters, but they will not remain yours because they will be taken prisoner. Buzzing insects will take possession of all your trees and your land's produce. The resident alien among you will rise higher and higher above you while you sink lower and lower. He will lend to you, but you won't lend to him. He will be the head and you will be the tail. All these curses will come, pursue, and overtake you until you are destroyed since you did not obey the Lord your God and keep the commands and statutes he gave you. These curses will be a sign and a wonder against you and your descendants forever because you didn't serve the Lord your God with joy and a cheerful heart even though you had an abundance of everything. You will serve your enemies that the Lord will send against you in famine, thirst, nakedness, and a lack of everything. He will place an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation from far away from the ends of the earth to swoop down on you like an eagle, a nation whose language you won't understand, a ruthless nation showing no respect for the old and not sparing the young. They will eat the offspring of your livestock and your land's produce until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine, fresh oil, young of the herds or newborn of your flocks until they cause you to perish. They will besiege you within all your city gates until your high and fortified walls that you trust in come down throughout your land. They will besiege you within all your city gates throughout the land the Lord your God has given you. You will eat your offspring, the flesh of your sons and daughters the Lord has given you during the siege and hardship your enemy imposes on you. The most sensitive and refined man upon you, among you, will look grudgingly at his brother, the wife he embraces, and the rest of his children, refusing to share with any of them his children's flesh that he will eat because he has nothing left during the siege and hardship your enemy imposes on you and all your towns. The most sensitive and refined woman among you who will not venture to set the sole of her feet on the ground because of her refinement and sensitivity will begrudge the husband she embraces, her son and her daughter, the afterbirth that comes out from between her legs and the children she bears because she will secretly eat them for lack of anything else during the siege and hardship your enemy imposes on you within your gates. Good heavens. If you are not careful to obey all the words of this law, which you are, which are written in this scroll, by fearing this glorious and awe-inspiring name, the Lord your God, he will bring wondrous plagues on you and your descendants, severe and lasting plagues, and terrible and chronic sicknesses. He will afflict you again with all the diseases of Egypt, which you dreaded, and they will cling to you. The Lord will also afflict you with every sickness and plague not recorded in the book of this law until you are destroyed. Though you were as numerous as the stars of the sky, you will be left with only a few people because you did not obey the Lord your God. Just as the Lord was glad to cause you to prosper and to multiply you, so he will also be glad to cause you to perish and to destroy you. You will be ripped out of the earth, out of the land you are entering to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you will worship other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. You will find no peace among those nations, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and a despondent spirit. Your life will hang in doubt before you. You will be in dread night and day, never certain of survival. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening, and in the evening you will say, if only it were morning, because of the dread you will have in your heart, and because of what 
what you will see. The Lord will take you back in ships to Egypt by a route that I said you would never see again. There you will sell yourselves to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Ugh, Lord, have mercy. Psalm 119, 25 through 48. My life is down in the dust. Give me life through your word. I told you about my life and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Help me understand the meaning of your precepts so that I can meditate on your wonders. I am weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. Keep me from the way of deceit and graciously give me your instructions. Instruction. I have chosen the way of truth. I have set your ordinances before me. I cling to your decrees. Lord, do not put me to shame. I pursue the way of your commands, for you broaden my understanding. Teach me, Lord, the meaning of your statutes, and I will always keep them. Help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Help me stay on the path of your commands, for I take pleasure in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to dishonest profit. Turn my eyes from looking at what is worth Give me life in your ways. Confirm what you said to your servant, for it produces reverence for you. Turn away the disgrace I dread. Indeed, your judgments are good. How I long for your precepts. Give me life through your righteousness. Let your faithful love come to me, Lord, your salvation as you promised. Then I can answer the one who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Never take the word of truth from my mouth, for I hope in your judgments. I will always obey your instructions forever and ever. I will walk freely in an open place because I study your precepts. I will speak of your decrees before kings and not be ashamed. I delight in your commands, which I love. I will lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and will meditate on your statute. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus answered him, Allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Good day to you, friends. Godspeed.